2020. Uh, we're here for a regularly scheduled New Market School Board meeting. I will begin with a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So, um, Susan, the, the first order of business is public comment. I haven't received any. I have not either. Okay. And I see no. Uh, members of the public in the audience. Again, I just would remind folks that we have been, I think, for the past three meetings now, meeting in person uh, here at the town hall. Um, but also, if you uh, don't feel comfortable attending a meeting, you can always submit a, a public comment in writing to us, and we'd be happy to, to read it or, or put it in the record. Um, you can also join us by phone, and the number for that is 224. Nine one one zero four. The pin number is nine nine four nine zero three two three two. With that, um, we have an agenda before us tonight. Um, the first item on the agenda is the student representative report. Taylor. Yeah, so back to school went very smoothly. Students seem to be adjusting well to the new guidelines and following them. Uh, Thursday, we, the first week back, we had a fire drill and students stayed quiet and adjusted well to the new locations. We also had a lockdown drill today, um, Black Bee, and that went very smoothly as well. Um, for soccer, girls game is Wednesday, September 22nd at home against Epping at 6 p.m. Boys game is Monday, September 21st at home versus Farmington at 6 p.m. Cross Country also started practicing and their first meet is Saturday, September 22nd at 10 a.m. at Portsmouth High School. Um, the deadline to register for AP exams for the College Board um, and give the guidance counselor money is October 1st. Uh, AP test costs $94 per exam. SATs will be held for seniors October 14th at the high school. And student council is actually meeting tomorrow and we hope to brainstorm um, ways to boost school spirit as well as look for alternatives for trick or canning or changing drop off locations so we can still have it this year. That's all. Thanks. Um, and then, s by way of school committee reports, um, I'll just give a brief update on the on the building project. We're still um, uh, working through, as is normally the case in a project of this scope and size, has some HVAC issues. Nothing major, um, but we're just working on that. Uh, once we get done that, I think that. That's about the last thing we'll need to do. Um, the, we had an issue with uh, flooring we identified over the summer in the hallways um, adjacent to the uh, cafetorium. It was just uh, it was a plywood subfloor, so the tiles there were cracking. So that's been replaced with a more durable, brand new rubber floor, and it looks great. So, um, and everybody's noticed the new sign, I guess, out in front of the, the high school. I, I think that looks great as well, and it's it's uh, nice that. Um, you know, the, the, the high school doesn't have to go out there and replace letters in the cold of January. They can uh, do it from their computer. So and, and thanks again for the generous donation of that sign. Um, I suspect um, probably by the end of October we'll be able to know what the final, final number is. Uh, we're still under budget and um, by, by the tune of about one hundred and fifty to $200,000, depending on how things just shake out. So that's good news. Um, have nothing else on the on the um, building committee. Anything on SST? Nothing. No. Okay. Gary, I know you've been meeting. Yeah, the CIP committee has been uh, it's been a sprint this year. We've uh, <clears throat> a very compact timeline, so we're actually should be wrapping up by I believe Monday. We're going to have our last meeting. Great. Um, there's a few items that they've discussed, and uh, we'll be recommending to the town and the board. Uh, a couple of them are. Um, some concerns about the spacing, the space in the town hall. Uh, <clears throat> I know it's becoming tight for them and the SAU as well. Uh, and at some point, they, there, someone had mentioned that there was some thoughts about having some SAU offices at the art building. So they just um, kind of some thoughts about, or the need to, to maybe have a kind of a joint uh, yeah. space study between the town and the school to kind of figure out what space is available. <clears throat> The town hall is kind of unique because they own the town hall, or we own the town hall. We lease the top floor as, as a condo 
in essence, but we don't actually own a parking lot. We just have rights to it, so it's a very odd situation. So um, some thoughts about that. Uh, some thoughts about maybe trying to work together a little more to um, uh, to look into uh, bids for such as uh, IT systems and telephone systems and stuff like that. Maybe we could get reduced pricing by having combined bids. Um, and uh, perhaps having a joint facilities director position again that seemed to really be beneficial when, uh, when we had it. And, you know, we, we have a facilities director now. No, we're in the process oh, of I filling that position. Oh. That's just an interim oh, he's an interim. while we okay. go through the hiring process. Okay. Yep. I misunderstood. So that was it. It's going very well. Gary, thank you. I, I, I'm the alternate on that committee, so I've been getting all the emails to see all the documents. I know it's uh, it's a lot of work. I appreciate, appreciate it. It's, there's a meeting almost, it seems like, one, one at least every week for the past few. Maybe a couple of last week. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, maybe more. So appreciate it. Any questions? All right. Um, Susan. Yeah, so I just wanted to give a couple of uh, brief updates before we get into the meat of the agenda. And, of course, this week marks our first week of remote learning. And, of course, um, as it would be, um, we had some internet problems mm -hmm. where upstream from us, our internet provider had a piece of equipment that failed. And so, therefore, we kept having um, our systems go down every four hours. And it took a little bit of time to uh, figure out what the source of the problem was. And um, we've finally been able to uh, transition over to a new piece of equipment. So that should take care of that. But um, one of the things that's usually when you design a system like this and you're so dependent upon it, you have the fail safes, you know, uh, system in place for your bandwidth. And our fail safe uh, did not adequately support our needs. Mm -hmm. So I've asked Jason to take a look at um, how we might restructure, how we are um, contracting for bandwidth. Um, usually you have two different providers, so if one goes down, the other one, you know, it shifts over to the other one so that you never wind up in a situation like we were in. Um, we only have a very limited amount of bandwidth on our, fail, uh, our, our failover, and so um, it wasn't sufficient to be able to, to support it. So. Um, I've asked Jason to take a look at that, and also um, I wasn't particularly thrilled with the level of urgency that the company that we're working with um, uh, responded, you know, to our needs. And um, you know, we're we're all in this. Every school district around is in this situation where we're highly dependent upon accessing our uh, education, you know, through through uh, virtual platforms, and so. If we, if we can't access it, we can't, kids can't learn, so, um, and we can't communicate, so that's not okay. So he's looking into that, and uh, I'll, I'll report back to you, you know, what we come up with for some solutions there. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to cost us, um, but it needs to be addressed. So uh, I just want to mention that. Um, we still have some devices we're trying to get out, and um, as you all know, when we ordered the Chromebooks for our second grade and our first slash second grade classes, um, we knew that there was a longer lead time, and those still have not come in. It's been delayed a couple of times in terms of arrival. So what we've done is repurposed some of our really old um, Chromebooks, and we're actively getting those ready and sending them out so that um, our kids have them, but we haven't quite finished um, issuing those. And then when the Chromebooks, so these were interactive Chromebooks, when they come in, then we'll go through a process of, 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 you know, taking back in the older pieces of equipment and sending those out, and then we'll be back to having a few devices available in case something breaks. So, um, so that's kind of a little update on our remote learning. We had, as we expected, you know, we would have some little bumps in the road. We always do at the beginning of school. Um, those were our bumps for our remote learners, and um, and we've been uh, working hard to <laughs> to attend to those challenges. So. Um, also, another thing that was uh, totally we got blindsided by is Friday, uh, we got inf we were informed that our application for FEMA funds, um, not just for us, but you know, kind of categorically throughout the state, uh, turned turned down. So they dis determined at the federal level that um, schools weren't, I guess, essential, and so our request to access money. Uh, through FEMA was denied. So 
the Commission of Education had suggested that we approach our municipal uh, counterparts and see if they had any gopher funds available, which was money that's available to them that can be accessed by us, but it, it would never come to us. And so uh, Jana went down and had a conversation with Bill and learned that they did have some capacity and they had not applied for use of some of those funds. Um, and so she and Bill uh, were able to uh, engage in a dialogue and uh, we sent a request over to the town administrator asking if he would consider um, allowing us to um, move some of our expenses that would previously would have been through FEMA um, over to access that. Those monies go away and so um, the town uh, manager had a conversation with uh, his team and they uh, were able to accept um, our, our items into their grant funds. So, so we're happy about that. We recovered a little bit, but it was very, uh, you know, uh, very much a bummer when you get these school districts in the state which have relied on, and this is for things like your PPE, your ventilation system uh, assessments, and any equipment that goes along with that. Those are totally life safety um, pieces of infrastructure. And so for them at this point to all of a sudden change the, you know, kind of uh, arrangement was, was very uh, unfortunate. But And these were all things that were required to open up absolutely. from the CDC. Yep, absolutely. So you had the commissioner of education not go to bat for you, but to tell you what to do to try to get some, to beg for money from somebody else. Well, this was, it wasn't actually the commissioner's, this was um, over again. This is federal money. Right. So FEMA is federal money. And the federal uh, government was the one that turned, uh, shifted gears, not, not, this, not our commissioner. So he just had suggested that, you know, maybe we could look there. One of the things the commissioner did say also uh, to us uh, this week when we had our call with him, was that for those of us who have um, totally accessed all of our grant money, which we are in that category, um, from all sources, that um, he's working uh, to see if they can't come up with um, additional grants um, for those of us that have, uh, you know, used all of our uh, money, available monies, um, to see if get us some more money. So that might be another opportunity for us. Some school districts have not put in there. CARES Act uh, grants or ESSER grants, and uh, we have, uh, we're tapped out, we've leveraged every dime we can, um, so in, in another way, you know, he has advocated for those of us, and uh, we may have access to subsequent grants um, as a result. So we'll see how that plays out, but this was a federal level um, situation, not, not a state level, um, you know, pivot, as they like to say. Um, another thing uh, this week, uh, we're so pleased. Um, they're, you know, Gary and, and Elizabeth have been part of the team that has been meeting with our support staff uh, to come together with a, a memorandum of understanding, which uh, they voted on tonight, and we will review with you in non-public, and it's before you. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Gary and Elizabeth. And Erica McNeil on our team, along with uh, the Para um, leadership group, which includes uh, Pam Young, Paula Smart, uh, Val Mitchell, and Holly Geeky. Uh, we were here on weekends and nights and all kinds of time uh, spent on this, and so we're really pleased uh, that it was a, a, a good project. Um, we feel like um, you know the proposal that was adopted was was one that makes a lot of sense for, for everybody. So um, so that, and then uh, a couple of other things. Uh, on, the, on the teacher's front on Friday, we had our coordinators meet with their grade level or their uh, content area um, teams, and uh, we asked them to give us some feedback because we knew, all of us knew, and you know, to the viewing audience who was listening, that our plan we knew would need further modification, but we didn't want to make modifications until we got the kids in. You know, we could run through some of these um, guidelines and protocols and, and see what was working and then and what wasn't and how, how we could improve it. So we have a team of four teachers and four administrators that um, are reviewing that. Uh, we met on Tuesday, we'll meet on every Tuesday, and we're further 
um, refining our plan. One of the things that um, we got for feedback, and this probably won't be a surprise to anyone, is that our arrival and dismissal has gone um, very, very well. A couple of hiccups here and there, but once folks got into the routines, it's gone very well. And so we believe that we can make some adjustments there. So we've reached out to our bus company because that's a huge part of it. You know, what can we do uh, uh, drop off and pick up times and all of that. Um, and we also need to meet with our uh, public safety officials and talk to them about traffic. Um, but that was a topic, and so we'll be meeting next week, and, and, and we'll be moving forward with some suggestions for making some adjustments there. Um, so, um, and then, let's see, traffic and revisiting, and I think that's it. That's my report. Thank you. Any questions? <coughs> I was wondering, do you have to know, um, have any kids been out sick or been not admitted to the school at all? Um, we've had a few students that have come with some symptoms. Um, not that, as you know, there's a list of COVID sure. symptoms. There's Absolutely. about a dozen. And what we've asked is that parents uh, screen before they arrive. And um, nonetheless, you know, a child might wake up in the morning and not not feel like he has a sore throat or uh, a drippy nose or, or or something, and he might come to school and uh, and then be presenting then. So we have had a couple of kids that we have sent home. Um, and our systems there and our protocols there seem to be working quite well. Um, we don't have any known cases of COVID um, in our schools. We haven't had any. Uh, it's been brought to my attention that there's uh, some folks that have been exposed to somebody exposed, yeah, but nothing that has come inside of our uh, four walls. So in those cases, you know, there are, are people that do wind up getting um, asked to quarantine and, um, and that can be because somebody in their household was exposed to somebody, and so they sit out for the 14 days. Um, everyone, you know, in those scenarios gets tested. Um, we get the results of that. Um, and so there hasn't been an incident yet of anybody coming back with any kind of positive, though there's been activity, of course, everybody's hypersensitive to this, you know? So if the kiddos have, like, let's say, a cough and a rash, we ask them to go get COVID tested. Now, cough and a rash could be from two entirely different things and not related, but the rule of thumb is if there's um, at least two symptom, COVID symptoms present, that that triggers that we have, we, we ask the parents to then send, um, you take their kid to their primary care physician and to get a test. And then we wait for the result, but um, we haven't had any, nothing's materialized out of that. Um, I am meeting tomorrow with um, Steve Fournier um, and Mike Hoffman, who is the public health official here, and, uh, and Deb Black, our assistant superintendent. Tomorrow, we're gonna walk through, okay, what would happen in terms of communications, and what would our, we're kinda gonna do a couple of tabletop exercises so that we're on the same page. Steve Fournier is the uh, uh, head of the emergency management team in town, and, um, and so, He's usually the, gonna be the spokesperson for any kind of an outbreak. But, you know, if something happens in the school, it's coming my way. So we wanna make sure that he and I and, and Mike and uh, Deb, in case I'm not available, are all on the same page in terms of, you know, uh, who, who to call in what order. And uh, we're gonna put together a letter, you know, um, kind of a press release type of a thing that then we'll have at the ready should we ever need to use it. And we've seen this around, you know, yeah. we've seen school districts around us. So, yeah, yeah, Exeter High had uh, an incident um, where their freshmen, and it wasn't SST, it was Exeter High, they had freshman orientation, yep. And because they followed the protocols, you know, they were able to isolate, um, you know, who had been in contact. Um, and uh, and so also Barring, Barrington, yeah, Barrington Elementary.
Well, the first thing I would do is validate that. And so I have access um, to the infectious control uh, hotline. And so what I do in any time, a parent calls me, believe me, it's all weekend. I'm spending time with people that are like, oh my God. You know, and then I, we walk through and I have access to that. If it's somebody positive, I can, I can share that with them and they'll validate it. They'll tell me what the particular situation is with them. You know, um, if a person is positive, they have to isolate for 10 days. They're able to tell me when they had contact with the person for which they likely received it from, where they are in their continuum who's around them. So if it comes internally, um, in other words, to me, as opposed to them calling me, which is the other way it happens, right? If there is somebody that is COVID positive in our school, they will contact me. What I found in my experience with parents is that if there's anything brewing, they're usually like reaching out internally to their, to their school community. And so sometimes I might hear it first. So if I hear it first, I would, myself, I would validate that. And then um, they give you explicit instructions how to proceed from there. So I would follow that. But I know how things are, and news travels fast, and panic can settle in quickly, which is why I'm meeting tomorrow. Exactly. And if somebody, you know, um, in fact, I'm talking to staff about that tomorrow morning. If somebody comes in um, and knows that somebody's, you know, being quarantined, um, people can panic if they don't really understand what that's all about. And so I'm going to go over that with staff tomorrow so that they understand that that doesn't mean anybody's been exposed. Um, if somebody's been exposed, then, then there'll be specific kinds of communication that, that they would be, uh, would be shared with them. Um, and one student would, wouldn't be going out. Whoever came in contact with that student right. would be going out. It wouldn't be a person. It means that if somebody is being quarantined, there's something outside of our school that's happened that's causing um, our health officials to say, you know, you need to, to be pulled out of the mainstream society um, for precautionary reasons. So, so if, if, I mean, that's, that's um, kind of the, the process. So if a parent, if I hear it from a parent, or if I get a call from a parent, or an email, or from a staff member, then I just, you know, I, I have all my questions that I ask them. I get as much information as I can. Um, and then what, like, the tree is, I immediately call the in, in, uh, hotline. I review that with them. They've been really good about getting back to me within, like, you know, the longest it took was 45 minutes. They're pretty quick in getting back. Um, and then we walk through um, the scenario, and, and they provide me with um, exactly what the parameters are. Communicate and, and, and on one occasion, I actually did a, a conference call. So the parent who was really like freaking out, um, and understandable, I mean, it, it's, it could be a scary thing, um, could hear the same information and ask her questions because they may not have access to the same level of support that I do. So, so Amy, what happened in Barrington? Did they, did they send all the kids in the school? Yes, home they, at once? they put out the call to all the parents. They said, You need to pick up your child in 20 minutes, and apparently. The person, there was an email that had been sent, and they didn't see it until this day, when the exposure had been like, I'm not sure the five, seven days, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And so they just, you know, really didn't, I, I don't want to say what they did or did not do, but they made the parents come get them in 20 minutes, and um, the exposure was September 3rd, and instead of just letting like the classroom that was, had the exposure. Cohort, yeah. We made everyone leave, and it was just, it was really crazy. The traffic was, parents were crazy, you know, it was a panic. And yeah, I don't, I don't know the specifics, so I can't, yeah. I can't speak to that. I, I can just say that um, likely if, if, if the superintendent did that, he was, he was uh, asked to do that, you know. I don't know what the circumstances are, and of course, um, they, they can't share all those kinds of details, but right. I'm going to guess that there was a decision made. Yeah, he did send out a letter, yeah. and it did say the exposure was on September 3rd. Yeah. Uh, he sent that out like later that day to the parents. Yeah. Um, I did see that letter. My neighbor's friends, I mean daughter's children go there. That's the only reason why I knew about it, but um, 
And I think the other thing, too, that's important, I don't know that situation, you know, um, so I don't want to second guess what happened there, but yeah. um, the reason why we follow all these protocols is to minimize the possibility of transmission. Right. And so just because somebody has COVID and was in a classroom doesn't mean somebody's exposed, right? right. Yeah. It means they're exposed, I should say, but that doesn't mean they're going to contract. There's, there was a, a poster I saw not too long ago, and um, I don't recall what the source was, but it was showing that if a person with COVID wears a it reduces the, uh, the, the possibility of transmission by 70%. Mm -hmm. If the other person is also wearing a mask, then it reduces the possibility of transmission to under a percent. Yeah. So just, and, and then if you social distance, that's another layer. You know, so if we're six feet apart and we're all masked, the likelihood that it would it would it would transmit to somebody again is further reduced. Um, every time we wash our hands, that's another way it is when we screen. So all of these protocols together are what mitigate the uh, virus from transmitting from one person to another. So e even if we had a person with COVID, you know, we we have the we're taking those precautionary measures that would really minimize. We're not really taking a lot of risks here. We are not sharing um, equipment, furniture. We are, for the most part, social distancing. Or if we can't, we're putting up plexiglass barriers. We're doing our screening and all of that. So even if we had a COVID case, it still isn't, you'd still want to quarantine, right? Yeah. Those are all precautionary measures. But doesn't mean at all that because somebody has COVID um, and you're in if you are following protocols yourself, are going to get it. So um, I don't know what that situation is. I, I just, uh, I know that people are being very, very um, uh, conscientious about um, ensuring student safety. Not everybody is opening their doors to kids and, and they don't because it's a, it's a huge responsibility, mm -hmm. a huge responsibility and um, and all of these things have to be in place in order for it to even be uh, entertained. So we're, we're really fortunate. Yeah. We're yeah. really, really fortunate here. And we know, I mean, I expect at some point somebody's gonna get it, you know? I don't well, know. It's, it's, I mean, there was, um, you know, another cluster announced today, UNH. And it was strange because I, you know, I took, took my son to practice over there and I went right by the place, and I, you know, I was just telling my wife, hey, I don't, I don't remember those places. That was the place. <laughs> you, know, the, you know, I went to UNH back in the 80s, so that, that was the place where it happened. And it's just like, wow. I mean, that's like great. You know, so it's all around us. It is. It's yeah. all around us. And I said to the team, our leadership team, you know, it's, it's right on our doorstep. Mm -hmm. It's right on our doorstep. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to be ever vigilant about following protocols. And I have to say, as, as uh, Taylor mentioned, I, the kids are being great. Mm -hmm. We aren't having masking problems, and the kids aren't free. No, I, it's, when I go it, pick up my daughter and I see the kids come out, they're all wearing masks, and they're really like separated. They're not like, you know, now I'm out of school, I can go right up and talk to my friend. They're really maintaining distance. I yeah. was really impressed. Yeah, yeah. And the whole, um, when my daughter came out, you know, I have to go certain way and it worked beautiful. I didn't have any problems picking her up this week. Yeah. None. So it was it worked out well. Yeah. All, all of us. It, it, I, I said it a bunch of times and I'll say it again that we can only do this if we all do our part. Yeah. When There's, one part f f fails then that's when we'll have to close. But parents I mean did I said it in my letter that went out on Saturday you know. Thank you parents. You did a good job preparing your kids we really didn't have any issues. We really, really didn't. I mean, you know, it, it was uh, it was because everybody um, has come together to do something that's uh, really uh, beneficial for our children, and I would argue for staff and, and our families as well. So as long as we continue to do what we're doing, we should be um, able to continue um, with on-campus learning. So. Great. Thanks. Any, mm -hmm. any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, next up on our discussion item is the uh, fund balance. Jenna?
deadline of Tuesday. And I wanted to give a shout out to the town um, administrator and staff um, for pulling together with us. They had to rework some paperwork to make that happen um, at the 11th hour after they were all set to sit there, submit their report. So I just wanted to say, you know, oh, it was good. very done in a great spirit of collaboration um, with, a, with, a, with a very conscious mind that the same taxpayers are supporting both organizations. So I just wanted to give them a shout out. Thank it was you. very, very nice. Um, and we are very much appreciative. <laughs> um, so, most of you, um, this is pretty much a formality. All of you, I believe, came in and signed the cover sheet for this report that went to the state, the DOE 25 and the MS 25. Um, when you signed it, we hadn't had a chance to have a formal meeting, so I could kind of go through and give you the details of that. Um, what I'm going to present to you tonight, and just basically the number that everybody looks for is what's left in the unrestricted fund balance. It's uh, very is a compilation of our expenditures from last year and our estimated revenues for the coming year and it's very important as as it plays a huge role in setting our tax rate so um all of you were informed when you came to sign forgive me my glasses the glass fog someone's got to solve that um the unassigned fund balance that we will be um, basically returning as part of the calculation for the tax um the tax rate this year will be one million eighty two dollars uh, one million eighty two thousand six hundred and twenty dollars um, so that that's kind of what it boils down to um, I've addressed a little bit in this document telling you that you know when our audit report becomes available you'll be getting a more detailed analysis from from me called a management's discussion and analysis that will kind of go into more of the details that boil into that we do, haven't yet received that final report but um, I wanted to get this information out because that's typically what what uh, most communities are focused on, um, and to, to let them know that that that, that number is is uh, established at this point. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions for me about no, that. No, just just if um, you know some folks may kind of have their you know thumb on on how much we typically return every year. It's it, it's usually around four hundred thousand more or less, um, and you know so obviously this. It's, it's probably a, let's hopefully, it's, just, it's a one-time thing, you know, uh, it's, some of it's COVID-related, um, but, uh, you know, so it's, but we'll take it, I guess, when we can get it. I mean, it's a, it's a positive thing for this year, I suppose, um, but probably not expected to happen next year. Right. Well, there are a lot of things that go into that calculus, and as you know, we're in another year that's atypical. So, you know, we, we, are, we obviously, when we budgeted for the year even that we're in now, we budgeted pre-COVID. Right. So, um, you know, it, we may see some fluctuations from the norm, but we have to recognize we've had two years that really haven't been the norm. So, um, you know, obviously the goal is to, you know, utilize our budget to maximize student outcomes and maximize the experience for students. And I think this, um, you know, it looks like that we were able to thread that needle and be able to return um, some funding. So I think that's a really good thing for the town. Yeah, I think it, um, <coughs> Because of COVID, the number went up, but yet because of COVID, we've had to endure additional expenditures. But if you look at the total additional expenditures, I think the town's done, the school has done an incredible job of really keeping it down while still being able to open and provide right. the education. So it's really amazing. And uh, as Mike pointed out, timely that. Uh, well, thanks. I, on the behalf of a lot of people, not just myself, <laughs> thank you. Because uh, calculated, um, very careful. A uh, lot of thought has gone into everything that we've done from every expenditure to the needs of the students and what's best for the kids. And um, so it's nice to hear the positive feedback uh, that, that, it was, that it has been as, as successful as it has been. I have a friend who works at the company where they're doing uh, dividers, plexiglass dividers. I think he said they were charging six to $800 per divider. Mm -hmm. We got ours for a lot cheaper than that. We got. 75 free desks. I mean, there was a lot, a lot of effort in really keeping right. the cost down and still right. providing. Yep, and I think everybody that was involved in those committees probably knows more about granular detail than they ever want to know about, <laughs> you know, plexiglass versus acrylic versus, you know, we we had we really, you can speak to it. I mean, we we made a lot of uh, and, and and not without a lot of time to really investigate some of these decisions. We couldn't even look at a sample before we had to. 
purchase. You know, everybody so everybody else was looking for it too. Right. Right. So it, yeah. well, and we were early enough, and we were we were persistent enough, and we had um, we really had some great suppliers that really stepped up um, and helped us source what we needed. And and I know that that hasn't been the case for all the districts around here. So we we you know it, like like you alluded to, it takes a, a whole community, and we've had a lot of support um, even from outside the school community. Some of our vendors have really stepped up. So, Jan, I just want to thank you. I think you're doing a great job. Oh. You, you seem like you've been here forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you just yeah. got here, you know, and you're very methodical. You just think about everything. Well, that that's very nice to hear. Thank you very much. I, I very much like working here, and I have to tell you that um, it it is not work on behalf of any one person. I have a really strong team behind right. me mm -hmm. and in front of me, um, and it does really take a lot of um, a lot to move the needle, and I really feel like um, this was a big needle to move this summer. Yeah, so, definitely. yeah, but thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. And then I think I might be up, or did you want to discuss the, the calendar, Dr. Gibbons? Well, the second document in here is uh, fund balances for uh, the trust funds. So, what right. Jana has provided you was. Um, information from the DOE 25, but there's also other sources of funds that we have access to. And so the second document here um, is just a list of the six trust funds that we hold and what the um, balance in those funds are as of uh, September 8th. So this is important. As you know, we had some Warren articles, you know, some of the bond um, interest Proceeds uh, were used to increase some of the balances here. We also had a warrant article for um, uh, helping to support the playground at the elementary school, so $50,000 from the Repair and Maintenance Trust Fund um, is uh, airmarked for, for that playground. And then $200,000 is, is just to um, uh, enhance the, the balance there, knowing that there was a portion of the building as much as we did a lot of renovations and expansion, there was, there's still old systems and structures right. in place, and we wanted to make sure that there was uh, adequate money there um, in case some of the, those systems failed, that we'd be able to address uh, those needs. So uh, we wanted to share this with you. The Capital Improvement Committee also asked for this information and um, before information is presented to another board. Um, I believe that it should not happen unless information has been prepared and, and properly presented to our board. And so um, having presented this tonight, we will um, gladly share it with the CIP committee. And also good for you to have handy as we approach the budget season right. this year. Um, sometimes, uh, and if things get to be challenging and we don't get additional grant money, like we had with this FEMA situation, um, if if we weren't able to access the go for grants, then maybe we would have had to um, access some of these, and, and we still may need to in the technology area before the year's up. So, Susan, I don't have these uh, the purposes of each fund. Some of them are self-evident, but cataloged in my head. But um, they were established at one point, probably by uh, by a Warren article. Yes, and we, we, we have explanations of those. So yes, and it might be good for the board to understand what. The scope of use is for each fund, mm -hmm. um, and when it was established. Yeah, yeah we can do yeah, that. We yeah, we can do a more, a more thorough report. There's a, I know there's a folder in the business office that has, you know, when yep. they were established. Yep. Um, and for what purpose? So yeah, we can absolutely. And, and do I probably heard story. it three times, but I just don't retain it. So. No. Um, yeah. I do. That special education number kind of worries me because that is that a normal number? I can't remember either, but. If that seems low. That could be one student Three, number. Three hundred. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, well. Um, That's an emergency. It, it, fund it's a, yeah, and it could be drained with one kid. It's kind of a circuit breaker situation where if we were to have a student um, that wound up with, you know, uh, multiple needs that we didn't have funding for, then this would be um, a place where we could go to to uh, access money. Uh, so those services can be provided to the kiddos if we didn't have the money already in our budget. But my experience is that uh, special education, I say special education and payroll 
those two things change on a daily basis, on an absolute daily basis. So what we can give you for a projection on one day, tomorrow is going to change. Right. There, every day there's a payroll or a benefits change somewhere along the line. Um, and the same thing with special education. So you're only going to get a point in time. Sometimes you, you know, at this time of year, you'll have uh, fewer kids, you know, things will go better, right? As the year progresses and kids start struggling more, and you know this uh, to be the case, you know, sometimes, you know, that's when other additional expenses will crop up. But um, it's, it's a roller coaster ride in, in the budget. Those are the two most uh, unpredictable areas right. that, that, that you have in the school, school budget. So um, to have some resources available in case it gets to the point where the net of all of those uh, impacts uh, might put you in the red, then you have uh, the ability and the wherewithal to be able to address that. But something to look at for budget, though, just that number, just to... Could be, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, could be, could be something maybe we'll put a Warren article up for in the upcoming year to, to uh, enhance that a little bit. So, so last year we had a Warren article for $50,000 for the playground equipment. Right. Yeah. That doesn't go into one of these. It did. It, it did. It did. It did. Parent maintenance. That was Warren. the fifty thousand I was mentioning. There were oh. two Warren articles, one for two hundred and one for fifty. Ah, that's and they right. both yeah. went into that one particular yep. fund. Yep, yep. yep. But okay. one was your mark for playground. So that'll that'll stay there until there there's sufficient funds to, to complete the playground. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just to echo what what you said, Susan, so we did a ton of work on both the schools, but there are like six to eight classrooms that, that didn't receive any TLC and at some point we're gonna have to yeah, replace some rugs and spruce it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. There's there's some rooms that didn't get it, and also some of the uh, HVAC systems did not get uh, replaced. So the so uh, my understanding is the ventilation systems that connect the various pieces and parts. There's still uh, significant portions of those um, ventilation systems that are are not new. So. That in case anybody ever hears us talk about replacing carpets at the, at the school, they'll know that yes. they're not new carpets. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <clears throat> okay. So, I mean, a lot was done. A Tons. lot was done, but really but sometimes you you can't you can't do it all, you know. And sometimes between the time that you get a building project approved and by the time it's executed and completed, sure. things, things change. <laughs> well, this is this is uh, you know going back to a point you made earlier, Gary, about the joint uh, having a, a professional facilities person constantly keeping an eye on that and helping with the capital, um, you know, the capital outlays and capital improvement plans, you know, looking at what has to be, you know, Greg Marles did a lot of work on that, um, you know, in terms of roof schedules, you know, when those come up, you know, and uh, there's various phases for that. Uh, but also it's critical to have a person overseeing the maintenance of all the new stuff too, making sure it's 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 going to get its useful life and isn't going to wear out because somebody forgot to change a filter or bearing or whatever. And people need to bear in mind that yeah, we're the school club, we also have the SAU facilities, and there's you know there's other facilities that you don't necessarily think of as being uh, school related, but that need to be thought of. So, yeah. yep. so that was that, and then. Um, the next item, and Janet can certainly walk you through this, is um, the budget, uh, a, a draft of what our budget um, calendar might look like. There's some gaps in here uh, where we need to meet with the budget committee, and we, we don't have uh, dates on that. Um, but this, this should roughly um, uh, reflect what our, our basic, you know, deadlines mm -hmm. would be. A lot of this is um, uh, dictated by um, the state, so where those those important deadlines are, um, we 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 replug these in, and this 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 also, um, for the most part, follows the process that we um, we used last year. So uh, at some point, I I think the board usually accepts it. Um, We'll, we'll have to, again, make some modifications as we learn from the Budget Committee um, what their process is going to look like, so it might change slightly, but Jan has been working um, diligently to prepare us for uh, uh, gathering data for the FY22 um, budget season, so we're, we're prepared to move forward with, with this basic timeline um, and feel like we, We'll be able to meet deadlines, and of course, if we can't, we'll let you know. 
the only difference that I, that from this year to last year is last year um, you initially met and, and approved the calendar on the 5th of September. And obviously for obvious reasons, that was not in our timeline this year. So the front end of this calendar is a little bit compacted compared to how you proceeded last year. But we, we feel it's, it's definitely doable. Um, and again, it ties into the, um, a lot of the dates, as you already know, um, tie into the annual meeting schedule that's put out by the Department of Revenue. We've entered those dates in here according to that. And it does fairly, um, fairly closely mirror last year's calendar. The other thing, of course, in the summer last year, we had met and done our retreats. We weren't in a pandemic, and we set our goals, and we <laughs> haven't had a chance to even contemplate that. So that's a little bit. But we'll talk about that later tonight. I do, too, want to say uh, very much thank you to Jana. I, I know that those of you who were on the board last year at this time, um, you know, we didn't have a Jana. You know, we went a whole year without a Jana. How do you, you can, do that? Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, you can see what a significant difference it makes when you have a qualified business administrator working for your school district. And so you have been without somebody like Jana in the school department for four years. There's an awful lot of work <laughs> that, that uh, is overseen by this position. I, I look at this position as the steward, the steward position in your school district, you know. They're very much the person that um, is looking at, you know, compliance and deadlines and making sure that, you know, uh, there's double checks in place and your resources are, are being used in, a, in a, an efficient way. They're, they're, they're an integral part of the leadership team. Um, and without having a person, um, you just are really left um, unable to be able to perform significant and really important um, roles uh, in your organization. So uh, like you, I too very much appreciate um, having Jana here. I also very much appreciate having an assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction so that we can begin to advance um, teaching and learning in a way that uh, we have not um, had the benefit of in many years here. So thank you, Jana, for your work. Well, thank very you. much appreciated by me and the rest of the team. I very much enjoy being here. And the compliance piece, I don't get to be the fun one, just so you know. <laughs> I'm never the fun one. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jana. All right, thank you. So uh, Dr. Gibbons, would it help um, move things along if the board, um, if their board's comfortable? And certainly we can open it up for any questions the board may have, but approve the, the calendar. Um, this is fairly boilerplate other than, from what I've seen, other than crunched up, like 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 Jana said in, at the beginning, because of our circumstances. Um, so we, you know, I have that in mind, but the other thing is, is also to get it to the budget committee so they can understand what we're thinking. Yeah. And, and, and if it's the board's, if the business administrator is comfortable with this and you're comfortable with it and the board's comfortable with it, I, I would suggest we, we vote on approving it tonight. Wonderful. Okay. And then we can get it over to the, the budget committee. And I'd also like, um, I'd also send them, although they know, I think they know this, um, the fund balance number and the, yes. I'd like to send them that. It's always good to have the information. It is. So, Absolutely. Um, may I seek a motion to approve the, um, FY222 budget calendar. So moved. We have a motion by Mr. Swanson, a second by Ms. Tilton. Any further questions or comments? I think that's the first time you got my last name right. But yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I balk. It's not directly related to this. <laughs> now, you, now you jinxed me, Gary. Um, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes unanimous. Oh, geez. I forgot, Kim, <laughs> Kim Shelton is attending uh, virtually with us tonight. So that's the other voice we just heard. Thanks to everybody. Um, next up is uh, the donation. Yes, so Diane Beach uh, reached out to us uh, in the summer and she asked if, um, you know, we, we would, you know, like to have um, some masks made for the kids. She's, you know, quite, I guess, the seamstress and wanted to do something for our kids to make a contribution um, to our school reopening. And so, of course, we said, absolutely, you know, kids will think it's really neat to have 
um, all kinds of different masks to choose from. So um, she has donated 100 uh, student masks, and um, I just wanted to acknowledge that and have you accept her gracious donation um, for on behalf of our students. That's so cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I'll entertain a motion to accept that donation of 100 masks from Diana Beach. So moved, and um, I miss Diana Beach <laughs> a lot. So it's good to hear that she did that for us. I'll second it. We have a second, and um, thanks again. And boy, that's it's pretty. It's pretty cool that have a community member step up like that. Yeah. That's that's what it's all about. So, if no further comments or questions, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Um, and then we're going to talk about our uh, a board retreat. We had originally tried to schedule that in August, as we typically do. Um, we had a, other things on our plate in August. Um, so, what is your thought? Um, I think it's it's important for us to meet um, and you know talk about you know goals from how did we land and you know of course it was a very disruptive year for obvious reasons and um, yet we still made progress and I think it's important to review the progress we've made and then um, identify our focus areas for the upcoming year knowing again we're still in a pandemic. That doesn't mean that we can't have goals, and we should have goals. So um, even if we, you know, our original thought was that at one meeting we would talk about, you know, what we've been able to accomplish, and at the next one um, talk about, you know, what we'd like to put on our radar for the upcoming year. We could perhaps just do both of those, try to do it in, in one um, solitary retreat meeting, and. Um, given everybody's schedules are so tight and we're all doing so much, I think at this, at this point that might be our best strategy. Um, I know that we have um, the, the joint board meeting um, next Wednesday, I believe. It's next Wednesday, the 23rd. I had a, um, I had a uh, request from, from the uh, council chair Chairwoman, uh, as if we could move that to the 30th, if it was okay with, with folks' schedules. From the 23rd to the 30th. In which case, if, uh, perhaps. If do the retreat? Is, yeah, we could do a 20, retreat. September next 23rd? Is that what we're saying, September 23rd? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that'll be a negative. Negative. <laughs> Can we do it another time? Oh. So, oh, you, so what we uh, are we intending to maybe to do this like uh, over a over a day, like a, like a three or four hour type of thing? Or yes, I would say I see. a four hour block. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the twenty third is a no go for you. No go. Okay. Um, do you typically do it during a weekday? Both. Done it both. Yeah. I think we did it during a two. One on a Saturday and one on a mm -hmm. weekday. And, and I'm sensitive too that people are pretty much meeting out by now. I know. I know. That's the problem. Yeah. Is, is so, um, but I think it's valuable. It's kind of, I think, foundational to the budget. You know, for next year to it understand is. what our goals are. So. I, I I always say the first step in the process of budgeting is to review your progress from the year prior. Yeah, what are, you, what, are you, what are you spending your money on? Yeah, yeah. and yeah. how did you land, yeah. you know? How'd you do? Um, and then uh, what work do we need to do in the upcoming year to advance our cause? So usually in a budget, typical budget process, if you were really, you know, on cycle, um, we would be establishing that. Then comes the budget calendar. Um, and then we share with the administrative team what, what our expectations are, and they share that outwardly. And then the budget's developed with those priorities in mind. And we can still kind of do that. We're a little behind, but we, we yeah. can't do it until we, we right. as, a, as a team, sit down and, and meet and, and this go is, I that. mean, this is crazy time of year, too. Like It is. So I, I'm, you know, I can be as did, flexible as we need to be. I, I found that on these, um, it, you know, when they're held in the afternoon, you just kind of fade away. If you go from 4 to 8, by 7 o'clock, everybody's you know, falling asleep. 
I, I thought the most effective ones were the ones we held earlier in the early, like you know from like one to five or something. I know or even in the morning on Saturday. On, on a morning on a Saturday, you know, when we don't have other things that we're rushing around to do, and I don't want to take up anybody's weekend. Um, um, but that that that's that can be an effective time. Um, just on, is it thirtieth okay? By the way, for everybody to, to have that joint <coughs> meeting, okay. Yeah. What time is that? Yeah. Um, I believe it was at seven, Gary. Kim. That works for me. I just was I'm, I, the time, Gary, because I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Okay, so that's good. Um, what about um, what? What is? What are people's preferences? I mean, we may have work restrictions. You know. Um. You know, I'm pretty flexible. So, you know, you guys all work. So I can go by. You know, any day. I mean, I. I'm flexible. Is it so. possible to do a weekday morning? Not travel to you. Yeah, what, I can. What, what is your? I get there. I 7:25 to I'm home by three, so that I could get here by 3:30. So 3:30 um, is the earliest Elizabeth can meet. So you know another thing, you know, if, if we find that we, you know, we don't have an agenda yet. If we find that the, you know that we just can't get through it, we can always schedule another session. I mean, we did that last yes. that last year. So. Um, maybe maybe we can do a three or four hour block, at, you know, starting at like three thirty. And I think last year we did it over in Exeter, anyways. Um, um, which we it's not available, uh, but, but yeah. Patty can find us. We can figure out something. We can figure out something. Um, it, would that be okay, three thirty, if we started on a, on a day for that? That would work for me. I could do that. Um, in in. Is there a day next week that's fairly better? flexible? Like I could do the twenty fourth. Next. Thursday the twenty fourth. Yeah. I mean, if we did it, it I could do, I could do it then. I can do that. I can do the twenty fourth as well. Keep the yeah. Sorry for the echo. Twenty fourth at three thirty. I can do that. And I will. Uh, and we'll determine I where will it have is. Patty, find a location and let you know where. So three thirty on the twenty fourth. Gary, you good with location that? Location to be okay. announced. So let's plan on that, and uh, let's let's plan on 3:30 to 7:30, depending on our endurance, and we'll have food yeah. and liquids. We'll food. Um, awesome, and then we can we can find out at the end of that whether we need more time. Yeah. All right. Great. Good deal. All right. So um, next on the agenda is uh, approval of minutes. From September 2nd, the public and non-public minutes. Those I move to make a motion to accept the minutes from September 2nd, public and non-public mi minutes. Second. Any changes or edits? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those minutes are passed unanimously. And then we have the, does somebody have the manifest? I gave it to Gary. Oh, it's an orange folder now. <laughs> Seek a motion to approve the manifest. Uh, I make a motion we approve the manifest dating 9-17-2020 for $1,500,527.91. Second that. Second. Okay. Any questions, comments? Hearing none. I'm just, uh, just going to say that includes payroll from mid-August uh, mid to mid-September and the same, so it's quite a few weeks long together. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Unanimous. And um, Susan, do we want to defer number three, approval of the LOA? Um, yes. We'll, we'll approve that later after we talked about it in non-public. So we'll have to come out of it, out of non-public to do that. Um, next is the acceptance of leaves of absence. Yes. Um, so there's a number of uh, paraprofessionals and tutors that um, are now teaching for the upcoming year, and we're still gathering uh, their letters of leave of absence. 
that allows them to do is is to have rights to the position, their para position when they right. return. But we haven't received all the letters. We've been trying to hire paras and monitors and other things, and we just haven't um, mm. been able to get ourselves organized as, as quickly as I'd like. So I, I don't really need um, any, I don't have any in hand in the packet because we just, we ran out of time. So I'm gonna put that on next uh, meeting's agenda and hopefully things will calm themselves a little bit and we can, we can get our paperwork um, in order for you to uh, take action. Okay, and um, next is the coaches. Um, that also will be on next, uh, okay. the agenda next time. And finally, hiring appointments. Yes, so since uh, our last meeting, we have hired um, a teacher to replace Michelle Marrow. If you recall, we had hired uh, Michelle early, early in the cycle, and we're very excited to have her join us. And then she had a family circumstance that um, uh, caused her not to be able to join us. Um, and so we looked this, I, I mentioned this at the last meeting that I thought I had a, a person that we could put in there. What we ultimately wound up doing is review the courses were that uh, she was scheduled to teach, and they really weren't computer science courses. Um, it was more technology and digital literacy types of uh, um, topics. And so we had a gentleman who was a runner-up for one of our social studies position, a, a, a new um, uh, up-and-coming teacher. And um, he also had a background in um, technology integration. And so what we did is we worked uh, with him and designed a course called um, Technology and Society um, so that, uh, that we would be marrying kind of the history and the evolution of how technology has impacted society. And uh, we'll cover topics. Um, including things like, you know, critically consuming information, you know, um, um, you know, social responsibility and things of that nature along with, you know, some uh, historical context for how technology has, has impacted us um, as a society. So he's a history teacher um, and he's certified and qualified and I think the kids are gonna really enjoy uh, this class class because it's going to be much more relevant to uh, their day-to-day -day, uh, life experience and practical for them. Um, though we haven't uh, completely designed the curriculum, more the concept, we're actively working on that. So James Marsh, long way to say, James Marsh is a social studies teacher who will be teaching um, this course for us um, and we're really thrilled to have him. He also um, is a, I really enjoyed my conversation with him um, during the interview. He, very interesting fellow, who um, was excited about different ways that he could provide opportunities for kids um, that would be safe. And one of the things he is a, a I'm going to say this wrong, I want to say it's ultimate Frisbee, but that's not the right. Uh, um, Disc golf? Disc golf, that's it. <laughs> Disc golf. He he was very uh, a very accomplished disc golf player, and he was talking about you know this might be something that we could offer our kids yeah. as a co-curricular. That would be and great. He had a lot of ideas like that, so and I thought, isn't that cool? You know, uh, sometimes you know you just got to make lemons out of lemonade. Mm -hmm. And I really loved his attitude and the way he was thinking about you know how do we how do make how do we make some fun here in ways that are different than maybe we have in the past. So, anyways. We uh, very much uh, are, are, are thrilled to have James Marsh join our team. So he's the only teacher uh, since your last. There's been some, we've, we've uh, some of our regular education paraprofessionals. Um, again, a lot of these other ones on the other side are, are also COVID related. Um, we've had to hire people in order to um, be able to provide this learning opportunity for kids on campus as well as remotely. Um, so we've been trying to fill these positions of monitors and some uh, regular education paraprofessionals, and though we're not we we're not there yet. Um, uh, again, another plea to any parents uh, who are out there: um, we still have a need for some monitors and some paraprofessionals um, to help support our 
on campus learning and allow our staff to be able to um, go to the bath, take bathroom breaks and go get some lunch, <laughs> watch the kids, you know, while, while they're in lunch so the, so the teachers can have a break. Um, so please, if you do have some time, uh, please reach out to Patty Banfield and um, let her know that you're interested and we'll get you an application. We still need four more of those positions. Another new position that we uh, learned um, through our opening that we're going to need is, is a monitor at the elementary school, same situation, where teachers, if they don't have a pair in their classroom and they need to take a bathroom break or need to get a drink of water, you know, we need to have somebody that can kind of step in cohorts and they can't leave their classrooms this year. Yeah. They don't have UAs mm -hmm. that kids are moving out into another class so that they have space in their, in their schedule to be able to do these, you know, essential human things. <laughs> so um, we, we will be needing to add a six hour monitor at the, at the elementary school as well to cover, to cover that. So if you are available, we would um, love to have you uh, help us out there. It, it does pay a little bit of money, so you know, maybe it goes into the Christmas fund or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Great. So that's it. Thank you, Susan. Uh, any questions? So I take a motion to approve, um, to confirm the hiring appointment of James Marsh. So moved. I'll second it. If there's no further questions, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Approve. Welcome aboard. All right. That brings us to the end of our public agenda. Are there any other matters the board uh, wishes to discuss in public? Hearing none, I seek a motion uh, at a list here somewhere to go to go into um, non-public session pursuant to RSA 91A3, Roman 2, uh, subsection C and E. So moved. <coughs> By Mr. Swanson. Thank you. <laughs> Aye. Ms. Tilt. Aye. Ms. McKinney. Aye. Ms. Shelton. Aye. Uh, that's unanimous. We are in a non-public session at, what time is it, 6.14.